This is Anna Adamek in Vancouver, August 29, 2017. Could you give me your name and tell me where you were born? My name is Hani Hennen, and I was born in Cairo, Egypt. Could you talk about your childhood? What were your interests like? Um, I lived in Egypt uh, almost 12 years and um, spent six years roughly in Cairo and six years in Port Said. Um, my, my interests were not so much technical, uh, but I enjoyed uh, going to the beach, which Port Said is very close by, and, um, and lots of seafood that was plentifully available. Um, and that, that was, uh, and I also got, um, uh, my schooling was my, my first exposure to um, the French language, because uh, I went to a French private school uh, in Egypt that was run by the LaSalle brothers. Uh, so I learned after Arabic, French was my second language. And then I got my third language being English, after I came to, uh, to Canada. Uh, at that time, there was no ESL or any programs like that. So you, you lear learned it by immersion. <laughs> Why did your family move to Canada? Um, we moved to Canada because of persecution against Christians. Uh, I'm Coptic. Uh, my family's Coptic. And um, there was a fair bit of uh, persecution. You have to remember back in uh, 1952, uh, the, there was a revolution in, in Egypt. Uh, the Nasser kicked the, uh, the king out and kicked the British out. And in 1956, uh, he started, uh, continued a process of nationalization of different uh, uh, entities. And in '56, particularly, that was the Suez Canal. That he and we were in Port Said at the time, uh, living not far away from the mouth of the Suez Canal. Um, that resulted in uh, the bombardment of, of the '56 war, um, and that was actually my first encounter with Canada because uh, Lester B. Pearson was then the ambassador of Canada in the United Nations, and they started the United Nations uh, forces. Uh, so when we were able to safely get out of our apartment and uh, walk down the streets again, uh, this Canadian soldier, I remember staring at him, he had a Canadian flag on, I still remember that, and of course the blueberry, and um, stood and looked at him and said, I couldn't figure out, I was you know, roughly six years old and you don't quite understand all these things, I couldn't figure out why it was this is a friendly soldier, while well, before it was not a very nice soldier that you couldn't talk to. Or, and as I stared at him, he kind of pulled out a chocolate bar out of his pocket and handed it to me. And uh, I was taken aback by that. My parents kind of encouraged, well, no, no, it's fine, take it. That made me even more puzzled. But that was my first encounter with, with Canada. And uh, so, I mean, like every boy, I like to play with uh, cars and toys and guns and and things of that nature. Um, and, Were your uh, parents involved in science? No, neither one was. Um, in fact, I think on my mother's side there was nobody really involved in science or technology. On my father's side, nobody either was involved except for my eldest cousin. My eldest cousin, his name is Adil Sidra, and he later immigrated to Canada as well, and um, went to the University of Toronto, got his PhD there, rose to be provost, uh, and uh, became dean of University of Waterloo, and he's now retired and lives there. Uh, so he's the most technical person in the family. But at the time, after the 56 war, there was uh, a lot of upheaval in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, my recollection is that you ended up with, uh, with the British being kicked out. Um, there was a, the next group of managers tended to be Christians and a few Muslim uh, people, which was well-educated people. 
Uh, but the government wanted to, you know, they were a bit suspicious of that group uh, because of they worked with the British. And so they tried to suppress the, that group as much as possible. And, uh, and in the schools as well, there was a lot of spying. There was a lot of uh, secret police from the government and everybody was in fear as to who's going to disappear tomorrow. Uh, my parents realized that we weren't going to be able to get uh, a fair education and a fair progress in our, uh, in our lives had we stayed. And uh, my father decided uh, we were going to move and he chose Canada. Uh, we almost ended up in Brazil, but there was a revolution there, a coup there, I think, at the time, and uh, we ended up going to Montreal. So. That was the reason we uh, we came. Canada was open and welcoming, so we were very pleased and we learned English. Can you tell me about your education? Certainly. So at that time, uh, I um, chose to continue. Um, I, I sort of finished. Uh, grade seven in Egypt and then coming to, I don't know if you want me to start that far back or, or, or later, uh, but at that time, uh, about 62, um, the, the method in Canada for helping people learn English is to put them back a couple of years uh, in schooling. So I went to grade six, uh, picked up English Afterwards, I went to, uh, jumped on to grade eight because I felt that this is where I was. I was uh, quite fortunate actually because being uh, an immigrant and still learning English, uh, I was not put in the enriched classes. I was more put into the more uh, uh, lower level classes, regular classes. And particularly in some of the courses like science and math, I was really getting bored. And, uh, one day the principal walked into our classroom and said the enriched class right now is uh, got two places for students to go there. Who would like to go there? Well, as soon as that happened, my hand went up. <laughs> and he kind of stared at me and said, are you sure you're going to be able to do this? I said, yes. Where I got that confidence from, I don't know. but. Uh, certainly, um, uh, the thing my parents always did to me is encourage me to always do the best I can and always work hard in school. So when I was, even though when I was in Egypt, uh, if I was the third in the class, I was, why is that? You should have done better. Uh, so I was used to working hard and, and trying to excel. Uh, so that was good. And then, uh, so I, as soon as I moved into that particular class in math, they they realized that I could survive, do okay, so they moved me in all the English classes except for English language. Uh, they kept me in the regular stream, uh, but that was that was good. That was fine, and um, and that was good because it gave me uh, interaction with a group of friends that were also high achievers and hardworking, uh, and so uh, from that point. It was a matter of deciding where do I go to study uh, beyond high school. In those days in Quebec, uh, you left high school at grade 11 and then went on to university. Uh, except that I decided there was the option to go to grade 12. Uh, and I decided to do that as a way to save money. So I went to grade 12 when I had still figured out what I wanted to, to get into. My parents, my mother in particular, was encouraging me to go into engineering. Uh, my father was very silent. Many years later, he said he wished I became a physician. I didn't know that. But I, I don't have the, the gift for biology. You know, it, it just never struck me. Uh, my chemistry teacher in high school was extremely well, extremely gifted. and. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm, I look back now and I, I remember learning about many of the things that today we call metallurgy materials and uh, 
the way she taught, the way she presented things to class was very clear, very, very exciting. Did experiments with, you know, throwing sodium on the bath of water and watching it go up to flame. That was exciting to see. Um, so after grade 12, I decided, okay, I'll, I'll do engineering. I got accepted at McGill uh, to go in. And at that time, even the first and second year were general years. Uh, and in that time, I had to decide what I was going to get into after that, because then you start specialized for three more years. And there was a course in Introduction to Material Science. It was taught by the chair of the Department of Metallurgical Engineering, uh, Professor Bill Williams. And um, he showed us, uh, recommended a book called Man in the Iron Age, uh, which I read. And I was captivated by the history of metals and so forth. And then one day he showed us a movie in the classroom and this movie was about how copper was made. And that fascinated me. And the thing that fascinated me wasn't so much the techniques or the technical aspect, it was the, the, art, the, the beauty of copper. How you start off with a rock, and in those days it was, uh, they showed you, they didn't show you a beautiful mineral with, that's glistening, but you saw kind of a rock that was mainly uh, material that was at the no economic value with a few specks of, of, um, of mineral. And then you go through crush and grind and mineral processing, and then you put it in the furnaces and there's fire going everywhere. And, and then you cast it and you put other elements on it and you roll it or draw it and so forth. And you end up with a shiny, beautiful, copper looking material. <laughs> That is so beautiful. And look at what they started with. How did they do that? That, that intrigued me. That, that made me, that captivated me. Uh, so I went into the field and uh, it was rough. It was a pretty challenging program. Um, I went through it. Bill Davenport was one of the, our instructors at the time. Uh, others were people like uh, John Jonas and uh, Rob Guthrie, uh, John Guzleski was another one. And uh, so they taught us. Uh, Tal Salman was our prof in the mineral processing. Uh, so they gave us a really good, uh, well-rounded education. We went to work in the industry in the summertime and came back. And so when the time came to finish fourth or fifth year, would have been, I. Um, we had the choice of uh, going to industry or going to university for a master's degree. And I decided I was going to explore both. That I'm going to explore the master's as if I was doing an interview for a job. So I went around and interviewed a lot of the professors about what life is like as a graduate student, and what did they do, as, uh, what kind of projects they, they possibly had. And uh, I got also two job offers uh, in industry. After I visited those locations, I realized very quickly that I would be bored in those, in those jobs. Uh, I, I wouldn't be very much challenged, and I'd be the lowest man on totem pole, which is fine. But I'd be doing routine activities, and I, did, I didn't feel challenged. And I thought to myself, well, I didn't go to school for four or five years and worked so hard just to forget all my materials engineering. I, I kind of like it. Let me, I'll do masters. And I decided to do a project with, uh, with Rod Guthrie. Um, I, I hoped to, to have worked with Bill Davenport, but it, it just didn't work out. The, the, the problem that Rod Guthrie presented to me was a lot, was very intriguing. Uh, and so that's what I ended up doing uh, my project on. And... Uh, Can you it, tell me what that project was? Yes. Um, when, you, when you make steel, and you've got a bath of liquid steel, in order to get the right chemistry, steel is not just iron and carbon. Uh, it has other alloying elements, other elements added to it. 
either to control the impurities or to add to give it better properties. Well, one of these additives is aluminum, and it, it kills, so-called kills, it, it gets rid of the oxygen to a, a safe level to make a sound uh, ingot, uh, but it also um, refines the grain size of the steel, so it improves its, its strength. So aluminum um, is typically, at those days, was essentially ingots of it were thrown into the bath of steel and the yield of aluminum was pretty poor uh, people didn't know why so what had been done before I came along is the previous student had taken pieces of aluminum and dunked them into a bath of, uh, of, uh, of steel in the lab and pulled it out and found that there was a steel shell frozen on the outside of the aluminum. Which meant that if you throw a piece of aluminum into a bath of steel in industry, you would, first thing that would happen is it would suck so much heat from the steel, because it's a better conductor, that the adjacent liquid steel would freeze. And then the aluminum would melt inside of this steel shell, and only then would that steel shell melt back. So they had done these kind of experiments and they weren't sure, and they'd done mathematical modeling of that process and they weren't sure if the, if the conditions in the model were correct or not. So my job was to figure out and do some measurements with thermocouples to see if, they, if the measurements were right or not. But the furnace wasn't available at the time. So Rod Guthrie, my advisor said, go away and think about, uh, think about the problem, do a literature review so I did, and I would come back to him periodically and say, I can't find anything. Nobody's done the kind of work that you're asking me to do. And so he said, no, you're not looking hard enough. Go back and look again. In those days, it wasn't like a computer where you kind of type everything in. You've got to go to a library, you pull out the chemical abstracts books, you look through abstracts, and then you pull another book out, and then you go chase the, the journal, and then you have to put in an interlibrary loan request sometimes. So it was quite an ordinary. Uh, arduous process, a long process. And I would come back and say, I'm sorry, it, and nobody's ever done anything like this. It, the only thing people have done is looked at the thermodynamics of aluminum and oxygen. And that was work that was done by, continued to be done by uh, uh, Professor John Elliott at MIT, who was very strong in that, in that area. And so again, he would say, no, you have to look hard enough, go back. So I would do that. And then we went back and forth until finally he sort of said, okay, um, I walked in one day and, and sort of told him, look, forget all this literature review. I can't find anything. Aluminum is very light. You know, it's got a density of 2,700 kilograms per cubic meter, and steel is about 7,000. How long do these aluminum pieces stay in the molten steel? If you're throwing them in into something lighter, they're just going to bob up to the surface. And the light went on for both of us. And he said, oh, that's a good question. Go and do a quick calculation and see how long it would last. So I did, and I came back and I said, fractions of a second. And certainly it was far less than all the melting times that they had predicted before and found before. So he, so he said, my gosh, that means these things are bobbing up to the surface and oxidizing. So we have to, we have to prove that that's the case. So that became my master's project. Uh, so I couldn't, do, of course, right away do experiments with aluminum and steel, but uh, I had to figure out how to do experiments at room temperature. So using appropriate equations, developed a what we call a similitude, a physical model at room temperature, and I had to go and hunt wood balls, different types of wood, uh, water, properties of water and wood, and I uh, developed a contraption that would drop these wood balls from 10 feet into a bath of water, a high-speed camera to photograph them, and uh, wrote a model and did all that, and then afterwards I did do it in uh, aluminum in a bath of steel in the lab, and it was uh, quite 
uh, these experiments you would never do today because of the safety issues. So I had this bath of steel that was like right there, about 50 kilos. Um, I had somebody up at the 10 feet above in the mezzanine um, dropping these aluminum spheres that I had cast with uh, quartz rods and a little flag, foil flag on the, on the top of them. And I had a third person over on one side running a high-speed camera and a fourth person on the other side controlling the furnace. And I had this board in front of me and I was all dressed up in a suit. And I had this board in front of me because as soon as the aluminum comes down, it's going to splash. So it doesn't have to splash on me. But I wanted to recover the, the samples as soon as they bobbed up because I wanted to measure the thickness of the steel shell to check against my model. So I was there and as soon as the things fell, my arm went around and picked it up. Uh, sort of a joking part is after I finished my masters, uh, Rod Guthrie complained to me that I used up too many right-handed gloves <laughs> in the lab. There were too many left-handed gloves left. So. Anyway, the, the work was well. It was fun. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, we got a couple of awards out of it, which was really exciting. Um, my father at that point got, got after me, so oh, you got to get up in the real world. You're spending too much time in, in school. You'll be a permanent student for forever and ever. So I went out and worked in the steel industry for about a year, uh, all the time thinking about, okay, what do I want to do? Where do I want to go? And uh, decided it was very clear at that point that I wanted to I wanted to do modeling and simulation more of what I wa I was doing and in the company the, there was only one person that did that kind of work and, and that person had a PhD mm -hmm. so I talked to the company management about which company was that? Simpec Tosco at the time uh, about doing a PhD they were about doing that kind of work. As I said, you know, I have the background to do it. And they said, no, 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 we have one person. That's good. So it became clear to me, in order for me to do that kind of work, I needed to do, get a PhD. So I, uh, I left the company, went back to McGill for a few months to, to do a bit of work uh, because I wanted to get back into uh, more um, research type environment. Um, I was in the research department at SIPBEC, but industrial research is often about generating a new statistical model for, for a process line, and that was, I didn't find that satisfying. Um, so then I, I applied to different universities. I got accepted at the University of British Columbia for a PhD. McGill folks wanted me to stay. Some of McGill folks wanted me to stay for my PhD at McGill. Uh, Bill Davenport, bless his, bless his heart, he, uh, he gave me very good advice. He, he, he really encouraged me to move on and go somewhere else. Uh, and uh, he, he didn't tell me what to do, but it was very clear where he, what he thought, um, what, what his advice would be. Um, and so I, I went to UBC. I uh, worked with uh, Keith Bermacombe, who's passed away, um, and um, started working on a project that was totally different. It was all about Keith, one of Keith's projects, um, and this was a joint project with Paul Watkins, Paul Watkinson, who's a chemical engineer at, uh, at UBC in the chemical engineering department. He and Keith collaborated on a project dealing with uh, the processing of rotary kilns. And so they had done some experiments. They had a pilot kill. They'd done some experiments, and they had some results they didn't understand. So Keith said, "Your project is to figure out if the way the material, the granular material in the kiln, is moving, is the cause of why we're seeing these different results." Okay. So it was very different. I started looking at what we call bed motion in, in a rotor kiln. And, um, and that became my PhD thesis. Uh, and to this day, I'm surprised. It, it is the, th the two papers that were published out of my thesis uh, are still the most cited 
pieces of work I've ever done, which is That's really a surprise. Uh, they're still used, especially the experimental data, because we collected a lot of experimental data on a whole range of uh, types of materials, sizes, shapes, uh, uh, wall characteristics. It was a pretty exhaustive set of data uh, that people still apparently seem to be using for various types of uh, uh, whether it is ball mills or rotary kilns or dryers or those kinds of things. So uh, that's excellent. It is. Yeah, it's it's See, interesting. You talk you talk about your supervisors. Who do you consider your mentor or mentors? I mean, th those I would say uh, certainly Keith Bermacombe was a mentor. Uh, uh, Rob Guthrie and Bill Davenport. Those three I would say are key mentors in my in my uh, in my career. Uh, Keith, in particular, once I got to UBC, he cared about the welfare, the personal welfare of the students, um, and that was very important to him. Uh, so he would have his students over in his house all the time and, um, and socialize with them, not not as a friend, but still as an advisor. Um, so we got into really good conversations about uh, about the field, about uh, many things. That was also the time when I had my first international interaction. Uh, he had uh, Professor Denis Abdisser from uh, Ecole, de, Ecole Supérieure de Ecole Nationale Supérieure de Nancy, the Ecole des Mines uh, at uh, at Nancy, and uh, he came over to do a sabbatical with his family. I was the only one in Keith's group that could speak some French. So he looked at me and he said, you're in charge of looking after him, because that was our tradition in the group. And so it was enjoyable. And uh, uh, many, many years later, we, we kind of, uh, uh, after he stayed for a year, his sabbatical, he went back. Um, I finished my PhD and I moved on uh, to the rest of my career. And we didn't really interact or our path didn't cross until I met him at a, uh, a meeting of one of our professional societies called the Minerals, Metals and Materials Society, TMS for short. Uh, met there and he kind of stopped me in the hallway and said, look, we can't talk right now, but you got to contact me. You have to come and visit. You have to come and visit. He kept after me for two or three years until I finally did go and visit. And I regretted not going earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after I finished my PhD, uh, I still didn't know whether I should pursue an academic or an industrial career. Um, I interviewed far and wide. I had inter uh, offers from both. Um, and um, I finally, uh, that the, I ended up with a job at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I ended up choosing it over a job at the Alcan Research Labs in Kingston. Uh, I mean, they, they offered me a fabulous job at R&D and it was really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, but to do the research I wanted to do in processing, uh, if you went to industry, you wouldn't publish it. Mm -hmm. If you went to academia, you could publish. So I thought to myself, if I went to industry and did publish and it didn't work out, I'm stuck. It's hard to move. But if I went to academia and it didn't work out, then at least people know who I am a little bit. I'm still a young professional uh, and I can move from there. Uh, and so I, I went to Carnegie Mellon and uh, I uh, chose that because, because of that reason and um, enjoyed it. Uh, it was very challenging, it was very hard work. Uh, my first day on the job was intimidating. It's probably the best way to say it because on one hand you you uh, you get you board a plane in one city where all the staff and all the all the people around you see you as a graduate student. And you get off the plane at another place. I did do a postdoc. I just went straight into 
you get off a plane at another place, and all those graduate students and all those staff see you now as a professor. Sort of, wait a minute, when did this change take place? And then you're given an office, and you're given a pad of paper, a pen, and a telephone. And they say, good luck. And I say, okay, now I have to do something. <laughs> What am I going to do? What am I going to study? So what uh, did you decide to do? Uh, there was a colleague of mine in, uh, by the name of uh, Gary Warren. Uh, we became good friends. And so we started doing uh, exploring. He had been there for a few more years than me. Uh, had some industrial connections. And so we started exploring those uh, in, in terms of industrial connections. And, and I started to make my own industrial connections. Uh, I had an office colleague, uh, Cope, shared a suite with uh, Dick Fruhan, uh, who had just started as well that same year uh, as a faculty member. He had come from U.S. Steel's research labs. And so he had in mind, he had the vision of starting a steel center. With my background, he said, okay, I'd like you to help, would you like to help me? I said, absolutely. So we started visiting different steel companies and and they were interested in doing that. And so we proceeded to uh, start up a center on iron and steel research and uh, was very successful. It really was starting to grow, attracted a lot of good students. Um, and my work with Gary also grew, uh, but with, that was more in the processing of hydrometallurgy. Um, it got to a point where what we wanted to do, some of the companies saw as competitive. And so it, 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 we hit a roadblock and we couldn't proceed further in that area, which is unfortunate because it would have been an exciting route to continue going down. Um, through my work in, in, the, in steel, because we looked at steel making, we looked at casting, um, and, and I kind of was aware of these things because of my time at Keith, because a good part of Keith's work was in continuous casting. And so as students, we would talk with each other about what everybody was doing. So you kind of became familiar with different areas that people were doing research in. Uh, an important piece of history is that when I was at uh, UBC during the start of the second year, uh, a young lady came to join a PhD at UBC. And uh, they ended up putting her in the office with me. And she came and kind of wondered, who am I going to work with for my PhD? Um, she had done a, a master's at uh, University of California, Davis. Started looking around different professors and she sort of asked me, well, who, who do you think I should do a PhD with? I said, quite frankly, in my opinion, the only person in this department worth doing a PhD with is Keith Brimacle. I was biased. She ended up uh, doing a PhD with Keith Brimacle. She ended up uh, doing extremely well. Uh, she became then a faculty member at UBC and moved on to be vice president of research at UBC and moved on to be president of the University of Alberta. Her name is Indira Samir Sikara. So that's my claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so we're good. We're still good personal friends. Mm -hmm. So did you come back to Canada for the job at the University of Alberta yes. or did you come back earlier? Yes, mm -hmm. I came back for um, over 95% of the materials research done in the United States in universities uh, is funded by defense, defense agencies. And so they typically tend to be interested in the first cubic centimeters of a brand new material. I came from a pedigree of working with industry in, in research and doing fundamental research but relevant for industry. And the way I've always described it is, my job is to generate new knowledge that, that can be used by industry uh, to apply it into their operations, to improve their operations, make them more efficient and more effective. And so 
that was much more difficult to do in, in the States. Uh, I had full funding, uh, but I was always chasing funds all the time. And, and, and at that time, I was also raising half of my salary from research funds. And that was particularly stressful on the family. Uh, so we decided that we'd try to come back to Canada. Now, you can say that, but at the time, there was Keith Primacombe at UBC doing similar things to what I was doing. There was Alex McLean and his group at University of Toronto doing very similar areas. There was Rod Guthrie still active at McGill. There was Gord Irons at McMaster. So I'm looking at this and saying, so, okay, where am I going to go? They already have people. They don't need me in any of these places. And it just at one meeting that we came back to Conference of Metallurgist, a uh, colleague sort of said, well, the University of Alberta is looking. You should put in your applications. Mm -hmm. I didn't know they had a materials program at the time. Because they were very small and very low key. Uh, provided excellent bachelor's education, but they didn't really, weren't really visible in research at the time. So I went and interviewed, and um, they gave me an offer, and we accepted and made the move, and that was in 1989 when we made the move back to uh, University of Alberta. Um, so I decided at that point, but the, the other thing was, because of the structure of research in the United States for materials and for the area that I was interested in, it was extremely difficult to say that in five or ten years, these are the questions I would like to see answered in the field. These are the things I want to try to achieve. Uh, it was much easier. The system in Canada was enabling one to try and do that. Yes, periodically you get a project that turns you to one side or another, but you learn something from that in it, in eventually that you're able to bring back your original goal and focus. So some of the research I was doing in continuous casting uh, was uh, in the later years at Carnegie Mellon was with Alan Cram, uh, who's now president of uh, IIT in, in uh, Chicago. And uh, we would ask ourselves, why is the microstructure the way it is in the casting? and got a project with a company uh, where they had designed a new gas atomizer nozzle and they wanted us to understand how it worked. So I worked on that project for a year they, and then they decided to abandon things and but they left the equipment with us. So I thought okay well let's see what happens and it, you know if we can find a particle that's generated through this atomization. And you don't turn things into atoms, but it's a euphemism that's called in the, in the industry where you take a stream of metal and break it into droplets, and then those droplets freeze into, into powders. So if I take a powder particle, look at its microstructure, and I can trace its origins in terms of that particular part of the stream, and I pick another particle that was generated completely different conditions and I could trace its history and if they had the same microstructure uh, that could tell me a lot about maybe the microstructure that I'm seeing in a casting. It was very naive at the time. But so I pursued how do I generate a droplet of molten metal that would be under controlled conditions that I would know exactly what it's history was, and then I could uh, backtrack and find out what the, uh, uh, what the conditions were for, uh, for that particular microstructure that led up to that particular part. Um, and so that was the idea that one of the ideas I came back to Canada to pursue. And my first graduate student, uh, that was the project I gave her, uh, Ding Yuan. And, um, and she did it. She developed a technique, which we call impulse atomization, uh, that, uh, that does that. And I remember after I talked to her and we looked at the microstructures and the powders, and we started looking at this, it was a very simple frame that, that we built at the time, 
a very open frame and had a very simple crucible uh, resistance heated plug in the wall um, and she put some lead tin alloy in there and atomized it. Uh, the technicians that we had at the time, uh, at that time at, at U of A, were absolutely instrumental in that happening. Uh, we could not have done it without their creativity on their part uh, and their and their excitement and you know they were excited that this is going to be something new and they really put a lot of their talent into supporting what we were doing. And uh, so I remember one day coming home after really looking at this and realizing, my gosh, there's so many variables that could go into this particular study. There's so many materials that we could do. There's so many different ways we could do it. There's so many different applications that we could consider for something like this. There's so many scientific studies that we could go down. I said, I can live the rest of my career without having a single other idea. This is going to carry me for, of course, that doesn't happen. <laughs> you get other ideas down the road, but uh, but that was, that was sort of my realization, sort of my goodness. My career has just turned a corner. I got this thing that, um, that I think is exciting. Uh, whether other people find it exciting or not is another, is another issue. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, at the same time though, uh, living in Alberta, I very quickly realized that um, the importance of uh, steel in the West and particularly for, for pipeline and oil and gas transmission, uh, that it was critical. And um, and there was a steel company that was really the premier steel company, at that time it was Ipsco in Regina, uh, that was essentially um, the premier pipeline producer in North America. There was, at the, so, so I initially convinced my colleagues that let, let's take the students on a field trip to to, to mm -hmm. Ipsco to visit them and develop a relationship with people there and see if we can convince them to start a project. And we did this for about two years and then fortunately uh, Dr. Laurie Collins who was working at CanMet up to that point in time uh, got a job as director of research at Ipsco. Now I had worked with him when he was at CanMet um, because he was also interested in rapid solidification, which is what happens with these droplets uh, when they freeze. Uh, and we had worked together on a, on a project. Uh, his PhD was on rapid solidification when he was down at MIT. So that was sort of uh, a foray of research that he was interested in pursuing to some degree. Um, so we already had a relationship. and. Um, so when he moved to Evraz, I or to to Ipsco at the time, uh, I started talking to him about well, why don't we try to set up a, a project? He was interested in doing that because, you know, a um, we are the closest materials program to Regina. Uh, this is a program that generates bachelor degree students, mm -hmm. and from his perspective. If we are able to, if if Ipsco could have good recognition into our program and be seen as a partner into our program, then the students that go off afterwards and work in the industry would have a very whether they worked for Ipsco or not would have a good impression and a good memory of Ipsco uh, um, in the workplace, and we kind of and that would turn favorably towards Ipsco when the time comes for different projects and they would have a relationship because they knew each other so you know he wasn't he was uh, uh, that was a good good strategy on his part he also wanted to establish a, uh, a core group of faculty that would work collaboratively together to address problems that he would come that he ran into periodically where he needed expertise beyond what he had at the, at the R&D center in, in Regina. Uh, and um, and he wanted to promote uh, good knowledge uh, in the university that he could use in the in the 
R&D labs uh, to help improve operations and develop. So that was exactly the kind of thing I was hoping to do. So it was a very good partnership. Um, and I can't remember exactly what year it started, but we are, I think, on the fourth or fifth NSERC CRD with them. Mm -hmm. uh, we brought on, and the third one, we brought on TransCanada Pipeline on it. The, the next one, we brought on Alliance and Enbridge, but they decided they didn't want to continue, which is okay. So now we have a, a project that is with uh, Evras because the Swedes bought them and then the Russians bought them. And uh, we have a project with TransCanada Pipeline and them, and it's, it involves uh, four faculty. Uh, it has about uh, six graduate students on it, um, two postdocs, one lecturer, half a lecturer, because the other half comes from the department. And um, and we, we, we work on, on problems that we mm -hmm. feel are appropriate to be done in university. Uh, we can publish, we, uh, we generate knowledge for EVRAS that they use and uh, improve them. And we've been able to change and modify our approaches and our projects to suit their ongoing moving challenges that they keep facing, whether it is the Arctic strain-based design or or right now, thicker wall pipes that they have to... Uh, that they have so, to what are some of these challenging in developing steel specifically for pipelines and for SAGD operations? What are you trying to improve? Or, or what problems are you trying to solve? Well, in the, in the early earlier days of this project, when people uh, made steels for pipelines, uh, they were prone to a lot of corrosion. Um, and it turned out that the, a certain phase, a certain chemistry in the steel, uh, Fe3C, which is part of what we call perlite, um, is, very is very lamellar in, stru in structure. Uh, and so it, it would provide, a, and it's brittle, so it provided an easy path for, uh, for cracks to grow. Uh, and so people had to figure out how are we going to eliminate perlite but yet retain the strength of the steel. And at that time people were interested in developing stronger steel. So they were using what's called X52, X being the API American Pipeline Industries uh, standard. Uh, it sort of means that it's uh, uh, X65 being 65,000 PSI is the yield strength. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of interest to go to X70, X80, X100, X120. And there were people throughout the world that were working in that area. It wasn't just uh, obviously us. Um, and people basically developed steels that required a certain amount of niobium. Uh, and niobium has a number of effects in the production line. Uh, it, uh, it controlled the recrystallization of the austenite during rolling. It created, helped create a pancake structure. People knew that at that time. And we're starting to develop steels uh, with that kind of structure. Um, and then afterwards the transformation to ferrite was there. And then, and then you had niobium dissolved, whatever's left dissolved in the steel, and also you formed little precipitates. And people had done uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy on these uh, niobium carbides and saw that there was uh, a string of them and they were five nanometers in size and basically said this is how the strength of the steel is improved. I personally wasn't satisfied with that as an answer because I tend to be a little bit more quantitative and I said well you know we're adding such 0 0.03, 0 0.09, maybe 0.1% niobium. How does such a pinch affect the steel's properties to that degree? So one of the projects that we did, uh, supported by, by, by Evraz or IBSCO, um, 
was to develop a method by which we would take a representative quantity of steel and dissolve it and recover the uh, residue, which essentially was carbides, uh, and analyze it and weigh it and figure out what the chemistry was. Uh, and from doing that and from measuring the properties of the steel and using mathematical models, we can kind of say, all right, the dissolved amount of niobium is contributing X percent to the yield strength of the steel. The precipitates are produced, are contributing Y percent, the, and so forth. And we came up with essentially uh, the grain size of the steel was about 40, 50 percent. Niobium had an effect on that grain size, but putting that aside, the niobium precipitates and the solid solution strengthening was another 40 percent and we could quantify that and we did it for a number of ranges of steels of, including some x80s and x100s mm -hmm. that were uh, uh, that we were looking at uh, so the uh, we could put a number on um, this amount is contributing this much to the strength and now with Evraz going towards thicker walled steels and they have to change their chemistry, they have to change their processing techniques. We're using a technique like this to help guide, this is the way you should go. This, you've done this, this is the precipitate results that you're getting and the strength that you're getting. Uh, so we're, we're able to use that kind of technique in a quantitative way to help them. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's a value to them. So that's one example of uh, the many projects that we, we worked on. Um, so is there an innovation or a set of innovations that you are the most proud of? Uh, for the pipeline, certainly, I think that's one. Um, the other one is recently we finished the project with a student where uh, we decided to add a cold wire to the welding, uh, improve productivity and improve toughness and improve properties. Um, and um, uh, we're very proud of that and we're hoping to pursue that further with these thicker wall materials. Um, it's, it's, um, it's interesting in that we haven't really focused on being necessarily innovative in our relationship with the steel company. Uh, we focus more on we're going to generate knowledge and understanding so that you folks can take that knowledge and understanding and turn it into something practical in the plant. Because one of the things that we worked on, that we insisted on in this particular type of project, we were going to work with the real steels. We were not going to work with uh, model chemistries. We were going to work with the steels that is produced commercially. And we we're going to do all of our analyses on that. So, in many respects, we did, uh, you know, all the SAG-D work we did, we did it on their steels, all the, the uh, precipitate work I just described, we did it on their steels. The welding was done, we did it on commercial steels. Um, they would allow us also into the plant to take measurements of their uh, industrial operations. And we would come back with those measurements and, and carry out analyses and models. So we were in a role of, I saw our role as generating that knowledge that they needed to be able to implement uh, to improve their product and, and, and make, retain their, their um, competitive place in the marketplace. Um, between you and I, I don't think it's the sort of thing that NSERC would necessarily rank highly in their synergy awards, but uh, be that as it may, um, I think it's, it's, it provided a valuable service to the company. Uh, it brought a bunch of colleagues together at the university that uh, continue to work together. Uh, we generated a lot of students that continue to work in the field, in the industry, in, in Alberta. Uh, and uh, I think we've uh, we've provided Evraz and uh, Trans Canada Pipeline with good knowledge that uh, that has been valuable to them and continue to be valuable to them. So I'm very proud of of those uh, of those accomplishments and I'm 
I would say we are probably the largest concentration of faculty and students in Canada, if not North America, that are looking at pipeline deals. Mm -hmm. So, and it makes sense. I mean, Alberta it is does. is the center of oil and gas, and uh, we shouldn't be doing that for for Canada, and for the Canadian economy, and for mm -hmm. you know making sure that we we are doing our part to provide. Canadians with, uh, on the one hand, a safe and sustainable transportation system uh, that enables us to, uh, to improve our standard of living, because energy products are a major contributor to our GDP. That's the reality, and it will continue to be so. And as academics, uh, we've been entrusted with a very special gift of being in a university and having academic freedom, shall we say, uh, but we need to use it responsibly and in this case I think one of the areas we use it responsibly for is to help in that, uh, generating that knowledge and, and people uh, so that uh, they're well equipped and well uh, prepared to contribute to uh, the Canada. And what was the what was the most difficult or dysfunctional project that you worked on, something that you would consider a failure? Well, that's a hard question. I would say um, the atomization would be probably while it, when it had offered many highs and successes, it also offered a lot of lows. Um, because at the time, it was just before we got into the pipeline research, um, I learned something when I was at Carnegie Mellon, that we, I needed to establish a strategic advantage. And with so many high-powered people doing work in the process, metallurgy area in Canada, I thought to myself, how in the world am I going to get somebody to get off a plane in Edmonton to come and visit us? I need something different. I need something new. So when this uh, Ying, uh, Ding Yuan came up and succeeded with this uh, atomization, which we were seeking to do, uh, succeeded, succeeded experimentally, I thought, well, my strategy is going to be, I'm going to patent it. I worked with the university to try and get that done. I declared it to the university. Um, at the time, they were really not equipped to deal with such innovations and, and, and how to patent it. Basically, they were trying to get me to find a company that will pay for it, and, and it was like, well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm here to do research, I'm not here to... Uh, and so at the end they said, all right, you, you take it and you run with it. So I, I thought, okay, I need this to be able to get companies to get off the plane and visit us. Uh, so I pursued it and pursued a patent on it. Um, at the time, uh, I wanted to pursue further improvements on the process uh, but at the time, our Dean of Engineering kiboshed that whole thing and said, no, you can't do that. Our rules at the time uh, say that if you're going to personally benefit from an invention, you're not allowed to do research on it. I said, what? Wait a minute. You can, you can monitor my graduate students all you want. You can review and, and, and uh, check out any publication, any paper that I send out for publication to make sure I'm not you know, lying to sweeten the pot. You can check my proposals all you want. Uh, you're going to get a benefit out of this because it's coming out of the University of Alberta. You want me to stop? It makes no sense. But he, he was of the uh, ilk that it was his way or the highway. So I said, fine. All right. I'm not going to use graduate students to develop the process. 
I'm going to use graduate students to understand the droplets and how they solidify. So they worked on the process. We changed things as we went along. We never published what we changed, but they got their thesis done on the basis of the microstructure that they saw. And uh, quite frankly, I'm thankful to him because it opened up a whole area of thinking of research that I wouldn't have thought of at the time because I was very process oriented, not so much microstructure oriented, although I wanted to move in the microstructure realm. So we kept the process to some degree going, uh, but on the other hand, we, we couldn't pursue it to the degree that we wanted. Um, once we got the patent, then we had a deluge of companies interested, and that was the sad part. And most of the companies that were coming wanted to know what we were doing without, what are you doing for free? And so that was not a relationship that was particularly enjoyable. Uh, process that was particularly enjoyable, getting into NDAs and uh, it, it would just consume huge amounts of time and effort that were just, uh, uh, you know, when their intentions were not noble, really, at the end of the day. Um, there were a couple of companies that were quite, uh, um, quite positive and quite open and quite forward about the whole thing. One was Naranda and the other was Alcoa. And um, we, we did a license with Naranda for zinc bat for alkaline battery applications. And uh, they went ahead, adopted the process and their pilot facility. It, they loved it, it worked like a charm, it was very productive. Uh, it generated a unique product for them. They generated a product patent out of it. Uh, they worked with one of the big battery companies, I can't remember which one it was. Uh, developed a product that improved the performance of the alkaline batteries by a good 20 percent, 15 to 20 percent, something of that order, or for the anode. And then uh, they waited for the company to put in an order. And the company one day came back uh, at the end of that two-year pilot period and said, no, we've got a technology in the cathode that we think we want to pursue next. So Naranda just kind of closed everything, put it on the shelf, and let the dust collect. And so I'm like, oh, that's sad. <laughs> and then with Alcoa, they got the idea to uh, use our technique to try to make uh, magnesium granules as feed materials for thixotropic applications. And because um, at that time, people were just taking ingots and chipping them. And then there was problems of contamination and so forth. But with if you could make granules, uh, millimeter-sized granules, then you could uh, they flow much more easily. They're finer in structure, so when you semi semi melt them uh, for thixo molding, uh, uh, you you would have much finer structure. You'd have uh, better properties. Look great. Uh, we showed them how to do it. Uh, they adopted it, they started doing pilot scale testing, because they had an operation in Spokane that made magnesium. And um, they did a whole cost analysis. And in three months they could turn profitable, which is unbelievable. Um, then all of a sudden I get a phone call from them and say, we have to stop. Our plant is being shut down. The Chinese were dumping magnesium in North America to the point where nobody could make money in North America making magnesium. So all the magnesium plants in North America shut down virtually overnight. Then the folks at Alcoa Research Center try to convince their management by saying, look, we can still get into this business. We'll buy Chinese magnesium and we'll granulate it, and we'll sell it grant in the, in the company that's just not interested, not interested. So that went nowhere. That's very interesting. Yeah, so that was that's disappointing. That's a very interesting study. You, know, you want to see your yes. stuff that go in. And, and that was kind of brought me back to, to our dean, who didn't want me to pursue further research in the process side. And I thought to myself, 
he's wrong because there are so many forces that determine whether something is going to be commercially successful or not. It isn't the technology. The technology, of course, is needed, but there's some there's market forces. There is uh, applications. There is production forces. There. Are political forces. There's so many things that come into play that uh, uh, that that he's, he's wrong in, in the path that he, he chose to go down. But anyway. Um, so, uh, I know we are running out of time, but uh, okay. I, just last question then. Uh, you are the director of the Advanced Materials yes. and Processing Lab. What are your goals for this lab? My goal is to develop young people for the next generation that are well prepared and well equipped for the challenges they're going to face in the future, whether they are academics or work for industry. Uh, that's important, I think, for them. And uh, I'd like us to think that we have um, made the University of Alberta uh, known for the research that we do and for the quality of research that we do and that um, uh, I think we're better known now than we used to be, not just because of what I do, but, but many other contributing factors. Um, and, and so, um, you know, we now participate in, in, space, in space research, space-based research on the space station because of this work that we do with atomization and microstructural evolution we're getting into additive manufacturing and we were sort of approached to participate in, in a consortium of, of, um, of universities to do it. So there's a number of these successes and, and, and visibility that uh, we hope can be maintained and uh, enhanced in the future in terms of the way we're moving. So I'm proud of our achievements and uh, however small they may be, uh, but there's always going to be bumps in the road. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you.